Well, we've been going through this series on 1 Corinthians, community in one, and um, you know, today we, we come to another topic. Um, when I started 1 Corinthians, I thought I knew everything about it, and I'm just learning so much as I go through, and uh, some of it I can probably articulate, and some of it I can't. The Roman church has long had what's called the seven deadly sins. Remember that movie had Morgan Freeman in it and uh, Brad Pitt? And they had these, you know, these seven big pride, envy, gluttony, greed, lust, wrath, sloth. I mean, who can argue with that stuff? I mean, if you're doing that, you're, you're definitely in big trouble, right? And that's what the Catholic Church decided. But not pretty solid list, not much gray in there. And then we have another list, the Ten Commandments. You know, that, that's a pretty solid list, too. And you, you say, well, if I'm doing those things, I know I'm doing something wrong. But recently, the, the Catholic Church... Um, came up with another list. They added seven more things. It's like we didn't have enough, right? So they added seven more things. And these are, you know, they say violations of the basic right of human nature. So taking part in polluting the environment, genetic engineering, being obscenely wealthy, obscenely wealthy, okay? Taking or selling drugs, having an abortion, Engaging in pedophilia or causing social injustice. Now, you know, quite honestly, I, I can see some wiggle room on these. Some of them no, but I can see some wiggle room. There's kind of some shades of gray. I, I thought about actually advertising the, the topic of the sermon with shades of gray and see how many women we would get to come, but <laughs> you, you'd probably be very disappointed if I did that, you know, by the end of the sermon. But, but anyway... There's, you know, if, if I turn my thermostat down because it's just too hot outside, am I polluting the environment? See, there's a little gray. Where is that? If I, if, if I buy the bigger engine in my truck, am I then polluting the environment and breaking one of these? Or, you know, if I'm really tired and I can't go to sleep, and, and you know, disclaimer, I've never done this, but suppose that I took some Benadryl and maybe a little NyQuil and kind of liked it. Is that taking drugs? See, it's, it's not just really all that black and white. Um, shades of gray. Obviously, there are some things that are black and white. I, I don't want to discount that whatsoever. Please don't hear that this morning. There are also uh, many actions that are in the shades of gray, and people have different lists, and we disagree what might be on the list. Through the years, I've seen a lot of things in the church, different kind of lists, and tried to abide by them. Uh, had an associate pastor, true story, had an associate pastor who would not wear shorts. Remember this? Because he did not want to cause the other women in the church to lust after his legs. <laughs> we assured him that it was okay. But he would not wear shorts, and we had to respect that, you know, and, and not laugh at him over it in front of him. Uh, <laughs> There's all kinds of different things, like some churches won't allow dominoes or bingo in the, in the fellowship hall because that's kind of gambling. Or uh, There are churches that won't allow you to drink coffee or, or, or tea because there's caffeine in it, and they consider that to be a drug. That's on somebody's list, showing movies or portions of movies in the sanctuary. They just have a fit with what we do here sometimes. Listening to Christian rock music. You know, that's on some people's lists. Or are women wearing pants uh, to church or even not to church? I mean, that's just, it's on lists. And, and that's not to mention other black things like driving an SUV or voting for a Democrat or voting for a Republican or wearing fur or, or eating meat or eating anything non-organic. You see, you know, this is huge. Or shopping at Walmart, Okay or driving a foreign car, that might be sinful, uh, or eating in a restaurant with a bar. Uh, living in a world of black and white, we know that it's just not that simple. It's just not a matter of list. There's a great deal of gray in, in our world, and there are legitimate differences between the convictions of Christians. And then we should respect that, I think, not just make fun of them, kind of like what I did here this morning. You, I really didn't think you were going to laugh. That was a surprise for me. But, but what some people see as being very serious things, others don't see it at all. And we have these different lists and gray areas and what's black for, 
for some is white for others, and what's black for some, you know, is gray for others. And there's cultural differences, and all these areas cause a lot of conflict in the church, don't they? As to, you know, what you're doing. And when it comes to those gray areas, I think there's two primary dangers here. And the first one is that we become a separatist. That, you know, I'm always joking about that we're going to get some land and get some double whites and, you know, move out to the compound. You know, but that's what Christians sometimes do is they retreat from culture and they say the world, the whole world is evil. And so we must get away and, and live out, you know, our faith because they're, they're influencing us, us too much. And the problem is, is that when we do that, we neglect the world and we, we no longer have an influence in the world. And Jesus was very specific that we were supposed to have an influence in this world. Matthew 5, 13 to 16 he says, you're the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its saltiness, how can it become salty again? It's good for nothing except be thrown away and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on top of a hill can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they put it on a lampstand. And if it shines on all who are in the, and it shines on all who are in the house, in the same way, let your light shine before people so that they can see the good things you do and praise your Father who's in heaven. Light can't be seen if we're living in a compound someplace, if we never have any interaction with anybody else. You see, we're, we're called to be salt, and we're called to be salty at times. And we, we preserve and, with the salt, and we poke holes in the darkness with our lives. And that's what Jesus calls us to do. So that's the danger of the first one. The second one is the way we react to these lists is that it's called syncretism where we just say, I'm just going to take a little bit of everything and put it together and form one belief system. And I can just take all this different stuff and, and put it together. And I, when I think about this, I always think of Fred Sanford. Some of you are old enough to remember Sanford and Sons. Are, are you you're re-engaging with him, you know, on Nick at Night or whatever it is that you're watching him on? But old Fred, one time he was going to fly and Fred was scared to death. And so he came out and he had a great big cross around his neck and he had a star David and he had a crystal and he had some other junk and a rabbit's foot. And Lamont comes, he goes, Dad, Dad, what are you doing? You look stupid. He says, I'm not taking any chances. See, he's got everything covered. And that's kind of what syncretism is, is we, we take everything and try to just put it into one system, but it doesn't fit, you know, it won't go together uh, just because some of those things are in conflict together. And, it, it, you know, the church meshes with the world system. If it meshes too much with the world system, then there's no distinction. And as Jesus would have said, your salt has lost its saltiness. No longer a distinctive follower of mine, but I can't tell the difference between you and anyone else. So those are the two common errors that we run to. Now, Paul just so happens speaks to this in our uh, scripture for the day, 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 13. And uh, this is the new church that's at Corinth, and he's been dealing with them on a lot of different stuff. This is on a little different vein. I'm going to be kind of in the same vein next week again, too. He says, now concerning meat that's been sacrificed to a false god, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes people arrogant, but love builds people up. If anyone thinks they know something, they don't yet know as much as they should know. But if someone loves God, then they are known by God. Now what's going on at Corinth is kind of weird for us. I mean, this, this takes a, kind of a jump to get into our lives. It's a prominent pagan city. There's temples everywhere. Okay, so Paul plants this little church there, and it grows. And the people that come to his church, some of them are Jews and become Christians, and, and others are really just what we call pagans. They're worshiping all these other false gods. And at these temples, they would sacrifice animals. I know it sounds gross, but uh, that's what they would do is they sacrifice their animals, and then the meat would make it up in the butcher shop, and that was where most of the meat came from was for these temples. So no Kroger can't go there and get a nice steak, so if you want some meat, you're probably going to have to go down to the temple market, and this meat would have been sacrificed to some pagan idol at some time. So... The real problem for them is that the new Christians who had just discovered that the old idols were nothing, okay, 
Now they're down there in the marketplace and they're eating all this stuff and they're informed. They know that it's, these idols aren't, you know, they're, they're not really gods. They're probably the wealthy elite. They can afford all this. And then uh, he spends the rest of this chapter telling them what all that means. He says that knowledge puffs people up. It makes them arrogant. Love builds people up. And that's the two conflicting uh, principles here. And going on with verse 4, he says, So concerning the actual food involved in these sacrifices to false gods, we know that a false god isn't anything in this world and that there is no god except for the one god. Granted, there are so-called gods in heaven and on the earth, as there are many gods and many lords. However, for us believers, there is one God, the Father. All things come from him. And we belong to him, and there is one Lord Jesus Christ. All things exist through him, and, them, and we live through him. Paul says, now here's knowledge. You think you got knowledge, you don't have knowledge. Here's knowledge. The gods are nothing. There's only one God. There's knowledge for you, is what he tells them. He says, they are stone, they're wood, that's all they are. There's, there's no real power there. They can do nothing. Somebody made them. So really, the meat that's sacrificed to these false gods, it's nothing. I mean, the meat's not tainted in any way. We know that because the God is nothing. They have no spiritual power. He says, we know there's only one God. He made all things. And we have the freedom to eat it, is what he tells them. And we know that eating this doesn't contaminate us. We're not going to get the cooties from this meat. You know, it's been sacrificed to this God. So now to, you know, I thought about this. To, to, a, Christ, to a Christian who's been a Jew, this is the largest paradigm shift, I think, that you could have. Because you see, a Jew wouldn't even eat with a Gentile. They wouldn't even go to a home of a Gentile. They, they might be defiled, and they thought that what they did with their dietary laws and with what they did with their body was obedience to God. It pleased God, and it also made them part of that covenant, and they would receive covenant blessings. So it was all about what they did with their food and what they did in their actions and staying away from people, pagans who were dirty. So this is just, you know, all of a sudden Paul says, if there's nothing wrong with this, go ahead, eat some meat. And they're going, man, this is something else. We've been down there every night, you know, just, just, we, we never could go there, but now we're down there every night. Huge paradigm shift. Okay. Verse seven, but not everybody knows this key verse. Some are eating this food as though it really is food sacrificed to a real idol because they were used to idol worship until now. Their conscience is weak because it's been damaged. Food won't bring us close to God. We're not missing out if we don't eat, and we don't have any advantage if we do eat. Problem is, see, some of the church at Corinth had just come out of this idol worship. And, you know, they thought it was a real idol. And they thought there was real power there because they were used to this idol worship up until now. And their conscience is weak because it's been damaged. It says it's, it's, the conscience being weak means it's unable to process this. And they think that it's contaminated. Okay, verse 9. He says, but watch out or else this freedom of yours might be a problem for those who are weak. Suppose someone sees you, the person who has knowledge, eating in an idol's temple. Won't the person with a weak conscience be encouraged to eat the meat sacrificed to false gods? The weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. So Paul says, okay, here's what's happening. So somebody doesn't know that there's nothing to, to these idols, but, and you do, so you're down there eating, and they see you, and then they are tempted to go back to the idol worship, and they're led back into that because of your freedom that you're abusing in front of them, you see. Verse 12, he says, You sin against Christ if you sin against your brothers and sisters and hurt their weak consciences this way. This is why if food causes the downfall of my brother or sister, I won't eat meat ever again, or else I may cause my brother or sister to fall. If you sin against your brother or sister, he says, you're sinning against Christ. Wow. Now stop and think about this. You know, it's... During this series, we put these two signs up here. You know, I am a temple, we are a temple. He's, he's saying that if we sin against each other, we're sinning against Christ. Why? Because Christ is in the temple here. Okay? When we're together, he says two or more together, 
here I am in your midst. So he's, he's in the community. And Paul adds something kind of to the shades of gray. He says, when you're not sensitive to other people in the body of the church who might stumble because of your freedom, he says, you know, you're sinning against Christ. It's just about, isn't just about knowledge. It just isn't about freedom, um, but it's about love is what he says. Well, let me break this down to just a couple of principles to take home with us here. Um, meat is not on the blacklist now. <laughs> okay, well, you can still eat meat. All right, that's fine. Um, but the principle is, is that it's not the action of what we do, but I think it's what he's telling us is that it's the desire of, of what we have. The moment that the weaker Christian desires to go back to that idol, to that old way, you see he starts leaving Christ. And there are so many things across cultural lines. I mean, this actually, if this were read in a place in Africa today in their community, they, they could apply it because some of their meat has been sacrificed still to idols. But for us, it's kind of a jump. But I, you know, I think this principle goes all across cultural lines into this gray area. And we might say, well, can I drink? Uh, can I smoke? Can I gamble? Is that okay now that I'm a Christian? Can I still gamble? Can I still play the lottery if I'm a Christian? Can I go clubbing? Is that all right? You know, we'd, we'd want a, a detailed list of all these things that we can do or can't do. Can I date? Where is the line on sexual intimacy? When is it that I cross over to be actually sexually intimate with somebody else? Uh, can, can I play fantasy board games? Is that, is that still okay? You know? And we want to make a nice list for everybody. And, and Paul's not doing this. I think, think what he's saying here is this. If you have to ask, how far can I go? You've already gone too far. See, it's your desire. And if we're desiring, how much sin can I get away with and still go to heaven? How much sin can I get away with and still be in the family? Then that desire to get away, all right, is already getting us out of the family. We're already going the wrong direction. And I think, that, I, th I think that applies in any culture, in any place. If we're asking ourselves, how much freedom can I get? What can I do and still be considered to be a Christian? We've already left. We've already left that, that close relationship with Jesus Christ by having that desire to do something else, you see. So what is our desire? For the reality, for most of us, I, I, I think I could say all of us, we've got some old bondages. Some of us have been delivered from some old, old bondages. We've, we've, got, we've got freedom now. We've got liberty. You know, we stand in Christ because of that. It doesn't take much of the smell of the meat to think, man, that was good. Back when I was at that old pagan temple, that's some good barbecue they had there. Man, I'm telling you, that, that's some good pulled pork that they were serving there at the, at the temple. It doesn't take much to lead us back to have that desire to go back. But it begins with that kind of that restlessness, that, that desire to get more than, than, than what God gives us. In time, the old patterns do fall away. The old patterns, they, they get so you, you smell the meat, it means nothing to you. But for a while, it's very real to us. Years ago, I was auditing a 12-step um, group. And uh, I think I can share this because I'm not sharing names. It's just an incident. But in the group, there's a young man that was struggling with porn. And uh, he told his story about how that week he had had enough. And he took his computer and set it out on the curb. I thought, wow, I wonder what kind of computer it was. I wonder if it had a fast processor in it or not. You know, he's going to say, Man, you don't have to do that. You, what kind of nutcase are you, you know? I sat there in awe of this young man, though. Takes his computer, puts it out on the curb, and says, that's the entryway from me, so I'm, I'm getting rid of it. And he's, he's kind of like these, these people here in Corinth that have been eating the, the meat from the temples, and, and Paul says, watch out, you know, have some love for them. You don't need to get them over the side and say, well, now, young man, now, really, it's not the computer. 
it's, you know, you, you know, you're acting kind of nutty here. You ought to just put it in, in the closet for a while or, or get you some kind of a software system on it, you know. And I thought, man, what faith. It just takes his computer, puts it on the curse. That's, that's really kind of a religious nut kind of guy. But you got to admire him. His desire, you see, his desire was for God. I think about him a lot. And so in these shades of gray, if I'm asking, can I still do that and follow, then I'm already desiring to be something, to have something more than Christ. And, and we should have some alarms that go off. When we start testing the line to see where it is, some alarms should start going off in our heads. I mean, and we should ask ourselves, where's my desire? Is it to get away with something or is it to get closer to Christ? Now, here's the other principle. It's a lot different than that one, but I think that this one applies to us too. The community of faith, the body of Christ, is a community where the strong care for the weak. And let me say this, that everybody's strong in some things and everybody's weak in some things. Nobody is just strong, strong, or weak, weak. Everybody's strong in some things and weak in some other. And, and Paul says that if these new Christians were going to go to sin, Paul says, I'll eat tofu and bean sprouts for the rest of my life. I'll never eat meat again. If it means that they will not go back, then I'll give up meat for the rest of my life, is what Paul says. In other words, he says, I'm willing to sacrifice something for these young Christians that, you know, they're very vulnerable right now. And the church is supposed to be a community where we have some reciprocity, where, where we care for each other. And where, you know, some can cover some others while they get their faith wings and they learn. And it's, it's a reciprocal relationship. Those who have been in the family of faith for a while get their faith strengthened by a new Christian. And it's like, you know, it, it, it happens to us. Those that have been around for a while, somebody new just, just comes into faith and my faith increases. Okay? But I don't need to take them over in the corner and say, now listen, you got liberty. You can do anything you want now that you're a Christian. See, that's not, I should have some care for them. And, and if, it means that, that, um, if it means that I sacrifice some things, that I don't, we'll just keep with the meat. If, if I don't eat the meat anymore, all right, then that's worth it because this person can't stand, you know, the kind of freedom maybe that I really want to tell him about. And there'll be a time. There'll be a time for that. It's important stuff, guys. Mark 9, 42, Jesus said it this way. He said, as for whoever causes these little ones who believe in me to trip and fall into sin, it would be better off for them to have a huge stone hung around their necks and be thrown into the lake. Oh, Jesus, that's extreme. Isn't that extreme? Cause one of these little ones to stumble, you're going to get thrown in the lake with a big stone, millstone hung around your neck. But... You know, his, his analogy is, is accurate. He says, you know, take care of each other. Watch, watch people. You know, you should know where the weaknesses are in someone and extend your love to them, you know, to take care of them. Now, a few obvious things here. I think Jesus envisions a community. He envisions a community for us where we know these things about each other. You can't know these things if you're sitting in a, excuse me, if you're sitting in a, at a sanctuary of 3,000 people, and that's all you do is you just go in and listen and come back out, you can't know those things about anybody. And I think he assumes that the church will, will have such a deep relationship with each other that, that we have the knowledge and the availability to care for each other. And, you know, man, I, I desire this for us. I desire this for us so much. Um, I want us to be the kind of community where people love on each other and sacrifice for each other to, to encourage each other's walks with the Lord. And not a community where we can get away with things, but a, a close-knit Christian community when if someone starts testing the line, somebody else says, I think your desire might be getting a little weak. Come along, let, let's, let's walk together for a while. So a question for you, are you ready for that? I, I don't know. Maybe maybe some of us are, maybe some of us aren't. Uh, it's not like I'm going to get in your stuff and call you out. Um, but I, th I think what, what Paul has in Corinth and what Jesus envisions of the church is to be the kind of place where there's that kind of mutual care 
um, might call it accountability, but he says it's in love. Love is what dominates. Let's sit with that for a minute, if you will. Let's have, a, have some prayer time. As deep cries out. 